There is a seismic shift happening within the Republican Party right now. The GOP seems to be trying to use the debate over transgender rights to win over conservative Muslim Americans. Or as the host of this show so pithily pointed out in a tweet last week, quote, basically in 2016, Republicans tried to get LGBT votes by demonizing Muslims. And this time around, they're trying to get Muslim votes by demonizing LGBT people. Thank you, Chris Hayes. Take, for example, Laura Ingram. Here's a taste of her radio show over the last few years. We don't have waves of refugees from predominantly Christian countries who come in and then proceed to try to blow us up. All these other people, they got to stay in the Middle East. But we, can, we cannot be the warehouse of all these you know, Muslim people coming from these far-flung lands. You are not going to come into this country and destroy what's good about America. I'm telling you, we've got to stop this madness. And here's that same host earlier this month showcasing a Muslim parent from Maryland whose organization wants school kids to be able to opt out from reading books with LGBTQ themes. Us Catholics and uh, uh, other Christians, other people of faith have been waiting for the Muslims to step up on this issue and so many others. Our vision is to bring together people of all faiths. All faiths, which I love. And we want to restore the moral consensus that we had in this country since its inception. And we want to bring people of all faiths and even those who may not belong to any particular faith. Traditionalists, perhaps. Traditional, reasonable people. I think that if we come together, we can become a political force in this country that can save uh, save us from what's happening. You, Kareem, and all of those kids who spoke out and former students, you all petrify the left. It is a new level of hypocrisy and cynicism from the right. As columnist Michelle Golbo pointed out in the New York Times, apparently these days, creeping Sharia has nothing on the woke mob. Well put. And Michelle Goldberg joins me tonight, along with Wajahat Ali, columnist for The Daily Beast and author of Go Back to Where You Came From and other helpful recommendations on becoming American. Thank you both. Michelle, you write in your latest piece for The Times, quote, history shows us that nothing drives conservatives to reach out to groups they once feared as much as another group that they fear even more. I wonder whether it's not just the fear, it's the kind of divide and rule mentality that has been there for a long time when it comes to, I don't know, a white conservative right wing majority and various minority groups pit them against one another. Well, right. And I think we saw the reverse of this in 2016. I mean, if you go back to the Republican convention that year, the Republican convention where Donald Trump was nominated, you had this very kind of risque gay party with all of these photographs. They called the twinks for Trump. These photographs of these kind of half dressed adolescent looking boys in MAGA hats. And <clears throat> excuse me, you had a well-known Dutch nativist politician talking. And back then, I think it was very common for the American right that was emulating the European right. The European right had really leaned into this idea that Muslim immigration threatens hard-won sexual freedoms and is a particular threat to gay people. And at that moment of panic over creeping Sharia and, you know, kind of stealth jihadism and all the different yes. men of the right, you saw this tacit alliance with gay people. And I think that the warning here for anyone tempted to make an alliance just is in how quickly they um, turned on their erstwhile allies. And Wajahat, as a Muslim who's been studying and reporting on Islamophobia for years now, what do you make of this new GOP outreach to Muslims? I mean, people forget that until George W. Bush and the war on terror came along, Republicans were trying to reach out to conservative Muslims. Yeah, these Muslims who are supporting the right in their attack on LGBTQ plus families and kids, it reminds me of halal chickens lining up for Colonel Sanders. It's a classic divide and conquer technique of white supremacy in this country to have marginalized groups pitted against each other, right? The, the toxic model minority stereotype. And what's so sad specifically to see some Muslims fall for this is that we're not that far removed from 9-11. We're not that far removed from the 2010 midterms. May they were the same exact playbook that is used against CRT and wokeness, which is used to attack transgender kids, was used against Muslims. The Sharia panic, all these people protesting Sharia. Can you define it? We can't, but we have to stop it. And what happened as a result of that? Anti-Muslim bigotry, fear-mongering, conspiracy theories, and the removal of Muslim Americans from America's political, civic, and social life. Fast forward 12 years, and now you're having some of these suburban Muslim parents whom God has given everything except peace of mind, apparently, fall for these same conspiracy theories, literally fall for this panic. I'm in the WhatsApp groups. You're in the WhatsApp groups. I've heard this is happening. I've heard that's happening. I'm like, is this affecting you in any way? No. But think about our children. It's the same exact 
literally copycat of the anti-Sharia bias and hysteria now being used against also, Muslims. And what I see is them opening the door for their former and future butchers, sharpening the knives, and it will be used against us and other people of color. And they don't see that they're being co-opted and used by people like Laura Ingram, who's openly celebrating it on yes. her show. I mean, you don't even have to go back to 2001, 9, 11, or 2010 midterms. You have Marjorie Taylor Greene right now in the GOP caucus. Uh, people, you know, somebody who said outrageous things about Islam and Muslims is one of the most influential members of the House. Michelle, I've got to broaden this discussion out. The GOP may be exacerbating this divide, seeming quote-unquote divide between LGBTQ and Muslim communities, but they're not always the cause of it. When you see what happened at a Muslim-majority city council in Michigan recently, where the council recently voted to ban pride flags on city property, you do then see a lot of genuine liberal dismay, do you not? You do see signs of a perhaps worrying ideological divide at the local level. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think that, look, there's obvious tensions between conservative religiosity and, you know, kind of extreme notions, or not even extreme notions, but notions, sexual tolerance and sexual liberation. Those things have been in tension in the United States. They're in tension all over the world. And it is not surprising on some level that there's some commonality between conservative Christians and conservative Muslims because, and, you know, and conservative Jews for that matter, because they do have a lot, um, you know, they, they have a similar investment in traditional gender roles and patriarchal authority. And so this is a problem potentially for Democrats in states like Michigan, where the Muslim vote is very, um, is very important and influential. But I also think that you can, just because the Republican Party and conservative activists didn't invent these tensions, that doesn't mean that they're not exploiting them and, um, you know, kind of pouring gasoline on them, because you didn't see these sort of protests, say, two years ago, four years ago. And it's not as if there that much has changed in terms of, you know, a lot of the yeah. books, for example, that are being protested, these, these aren't new books. What's new is the panic about these books. Yeah, I mean, Muslim Americans are just like any other Americans are equally susceptible uh, to propaganda and moral panics. Uh, Wajat, let me ask a, a similarly big question to you. Is there a way for people from conservative religious groups, religious communities, who do not like the pace of change when it comes to things like gender, gay rights, et cetera, Pride Month. Is there a way for them to, quote, unquote, defend their beliefs, uh, protect their traditions, religious views, moral values through peaceful protests, or whatever they want to do, without linking up arms with people who, once they're done bashing gays, will go back to bashing Muslims, or vice versa? Is there a way to yeah. do that without allying with the GOP? It is very easy. Look, I'm a practicing Muslim. Spoiler alert, I believe in God. I take it very seriously. And what I tell people is in our religion, it says, uh, you know, unto us, our way, unto you, your way. We live in a pluralistic society. And Muslims who are watching, you need to know that these same forces who are using us against LGBTQ have turned on us and will turn on other people of color and immigrants. It's a big tent society. You don't have to like everything, just like people don't have to like Islam and religion. But guess what? There are allies there when Trump did the Muslim ban who said, we don't like religion, but you have every right as an American to sit here and have your religious freedoms. So we might not like everything, but your family has every right to security and dignity, and my family has every right to security and dignity. And to those Muslims who are so offended with some of these books that might just mention two dads, just think about what signal you're sending, right? Just a few years ago, just now, like you mentioned, Mehdi, when it comes to anyone wearing hijab, we are targeted, harassed, bullied. What we're telling people is, we'll tolerate you, but we'll just sit there and barely tolerate you, right? What does that say to the kids? And so have a big heart, lead with compassion, lead with mercy, and have faith. Have faith and conviction in your religion. Raise your kids right, they'll be fine. And teach them, this is our way, we don't, we don't agree with everything, but that's fine.